Most people don't know this, but there's one singular two-part question that will literally determine the men you'll choose in your romantic relationships again and again throughout your life. If unexamined, you will experience unnecessary heartbreak on repeat. So today, I'm going to share with you what this powerful question is, how it impacts your fate in love, and better yet, how you can stop letting its gravitational pull determine your choices in men for good. I'm going to be as honest and raw and real with you today because I want you to break free from an experience of love that is far beyond what your heart craves and needs and has been wanting perhaps your entire life. To do that, I'm gonna share a few things today, including a bit of my own story to help you recognize maybe bits of yourself in me, in the other examples I'll share so that you can break free. One of the biggest problems that we don't talk about nearly enough in this society is that the choices we seem to go for in love, the times where you connect, let's say, with a guy and you feel there's something so magical about him. I can't describe what it is, but I feel so much pulled towards him. It feels like I've known him for an entire life. I feel so drawn, so attracted, so connected to, even though Maybe it's been a short while, but you feel like you can't escape that gravitational pull of that human being. The answer to that might be that your nervous system, the part of you that needs healing, is seeking to resolve deep, unmet, unhealed parts of you that need resolution. And typically those parts of you started early in life in your childhood. So I'm going to share the question right now. The question by itself won't do much good unless you know what to do with it. So please bear with me and listen to this whole video. The question that determines who you will choose again and again on repeat with your eyes closed, you can almost predict this if you were in Vegas, the type of partner, the type of guy you'll choose is based on the answer to this question, which is Whose love did you crave most as a child, typically it's mom or dad, and not who gave you the most love, but whose love did you crave most? Whose love did you long for most? Whose love were you most anxious or anticipatory in getting? That's part A of the question. Part B of the question is, what did you have to do, underlying this next word, to earn it? Whose love did you crave most as a child? And what did you have to do to earn it? Why is this so foundational and important? Because the type of experience you had as a child in many ways gives you this blueprint that unexamined will cause you to think you have free will when in reality you're going for a pattern that is very deeply ingrained that you can't see, but it's very predictable. So imagine, for example, you're an amazing chef and you get landed a new TV show that people are excited about. There's going to be lots of people watching both online on an old style TV and you get an amazing kitchen that's new, state of the art kitchen with every kind of tool you can think of, every kind of ingredient, meat, vegetable, spice you can think of. You get a chance to create whatever it is that you want in that kitchen. But it just so happens that despite having a plethora of choices, you end up choosing the kind of foods that feel familiar to you, the kind of ingredients that feel close to your heart, the kind of elements that kind of makes sense to you as a human being. So what does it have to do with your childhood? Well, you get the illusion of having free will in choosing men, but sometimes, many times, most times, you're trying to find the place in your heart called love that you learned was love as a child. And if that was a dysfunctional experience and you don't examine it, you don't work on it, you'll continue trying so hard to experience that love that is not really love, that might be some level of confusion or pain or abuse in the most unlikely places and ask yourself constantly, why am I not getting the love that I want? So I'm going to give you four examples, and these are by no means all the examples, there's many more, of how this might impact the earlier experiences, the earlier answers to those questions might impact your choices as adults. First one is, imagine that you have a parent that is incredibly critical, that is very judgmental, that is very harsh, that is always pushing you to be your best, but only rewarding you when you excel, not really meeting your needs when you're not feeling good, definitely not feeling excited when you fail and teaching you that that's unacceptable. What happens with you as an adult? You might end up choosing partners who are highly critical, highly contemptuous, always pushing you for more, never having enough, where you feel that no matter how much you do, you never get enough because the partner never has enough, but you're not really going for that love. That love is a familiar pain you feel from your childhood trying to prove yourself to a parent. Or for example, imagine that you had this functional parent who wasn't able to self-soothe and instead of seeking support and healing and help from adults, he used you 
a child to meet all the unmet needs. So you're the one who's emotionally supporting the parent. You're the, the one who's policing the parent. You're the one who's trying to make sure the parent has enough of what it takes to continue being alive. They may even tell you, without you, I'd be dead. And they create this codependent, horrible relationship. It's abusive in nature, where you are the one who's the caretaker of the adult. So what happens? Well, you might grow up connecting with human beings who are takers and not givers, where you give and give and give, and no matter how much you give, the other person continues taking, and you're meeting every person's needs. You're unable to express your own needs because you're always caretaking somebody else, and you catch yourself in relationships that feel so one-sided, not knowing why you continue going for that same type of human being. Now, I'm going to share the next two types, including a bit of my own experience, but before I do that, if you're a single woman watching this, and you've been unable to create the relationship you want, I have the hypothesis that you might be going for the symptom rather than the root cause. So what I've done is I've created a quiz after helping women who have not created the relationships they want to finally get them over 13 years in every content you can think of and every kind of wealth challenge you can imagine. And I put together a quiz you can take in about 60 seconds that will reveal to you the number one reason you're still single. If you want to participate, all you have to do is go to the first link in the description and see a page that looks like this, answer a few simple questions and within 60 seconds or so you'll have two answers. The answer to the question why you're still single and then what is the number one thing you can do based on your specific blind spot starting today to attract the guy you want in a fraction of the time. Third example is imagine that you were emotionally abused or physically abused as a child. What that's going to do is impact your self-worth greatly. So I can share from my own personal experience. I love my dad. He was my hero. And at the same time, when I was young in life, he didn't know how to control his emotions and he was physically abusive. The many times he was physically abusive with me created this feeling of anxiety and this feeling of unworthiness to the point where later in life, I chose partners that were not going to give me what I wanted, that were ultimately going to reject me, that liked me, but not like me strong enough, or that liked me for what I did with them, but never wanted to give themselves fully to me. And I was unsure, why is this happening to me again and again? Because I was secretly hoping for that. I was secretly seeking people that were going to reject me because I didn't feel worthy enough. I had this for a long time growing up, a super strong anxious attachment style, because feeling that level of abandonment from the person I loved most, I started seeking people who would never leave me. So one of the things I did is subconsciously connected with people who needed healing and who needed a lot of rescuing. So I said in my mind, subconsciously, obviously, not consciously, if I rescue this human being, they'll never leave me. But it was a painful experience because A, you can't really rescue anyone and B, you can't get from that person the thing you can't give to yourself. Another example, imagine you were controlled as a child. You were highly controlled and micromanaged by someone and somebody's looking at you for answers all the time and wants you to be who they want you to be instead of who you really are. You might learn to lie. You might learn to suppress your own emotions. You might learn to avoid intimate connections because intimate connections mean control over your body. So you might become avoidant. So you might be the kind of person who no matter how hard you try, you can't commit to human beings. You feel like it's too much. You feel like they're being too oppressive when they just want more time with you. Now, there's many more examples, but I want to give you something more practical right now. So what's next? If you catch yourself in this kind of dilemma where you're going for people who are toxic or the opposite of what you want, but not really understanding why, the first step is radical self-compassion. What does that mean? That instead of thinking there's something wrong with you, understand there's something wrong with the strategy of how you're going about it or the mental construct you've created in terms of how you can get what you really want. There is no progress without self-awareness of step number two is understanding what you've repeatedly experienced. What is the pattern? What is the pattern in the types of men you've gone for? What is the pattern in the way they connect with you? in the way you connect with them? Are they abusive? Are they dismissive? Are they controlling? What is the thing you go for? And how is that tied to the definition of love that you first learn while growing up? And the third step is, I'm going to say it as clearly as I can, at the risk of you wanting to throw a tomato at me, you're not going to get this change from a video. You're not going to get this change from listening to a podcast or reading an ebook. I'm sorry to say this, it requires deeper work. So if you're at the initial stages of this, never have done any type of help before, then therapy would be the first step you need to go to. Having a skilled therapist that can help you understand your trauma, your past, your pain, that's the first step you can take. If you've done some of that and there's still some challenges, there's maybe groups, coaching might be helpful at that stage for you, but I can't strongly emphasize the need to get help from people that will eliminate 10, 20 years of your trial and error trying to rediscover fire. Hope this is helpful useful and insightful and if it is it would mean the world to me and my channel if you click like and subscribe and if you want to continue learning how you can attract the guy you want 
without the need for gimmicks, manipulation, games, or stupid techniques, make sure to watch the next video right here.